Hello, everyone, and welcome to the fifth episode of our Below the Radar Conversation series. Today, we talk with Dr. Ethan Taylor, professor in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry at the University of North Carolina. With our host, Am Johal, he discusses his current research on selenium as an antipathogenic factor in emerging zoonotic viral infections, such as COVID-19. Enjoy the conversation. Hi there, welcome to uh, Below the Radar. We're really uh, excited to have Dr. Ethan Taylor uh, with us uh, this afternoon. Uh, welcome, Ethan. Well, it's a pleasure to be here, and uh, hello to everybody in Vancouver and Canada. <laughs> Wish I could coming, join you. <laughs> you're coming to us from Greensboro, North uh, Carolina? Yep. Yeah, yeah. 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 Great. been down and, here for many years after <laughs> living in Canada a long time ago, 40 yeah. years ago, so. Yeah, and wondering if you can maybe uh, start by introducing yourself a little bit in your your area of of study. Sure. Well, I'm a I guess a biochemist is a more general term. Um, I was actually a pharmacy professor at the University of Georgia for 18 years. Uh, so I, I you know I got a chemistry degree at the University of Winnipeg back around 1980s roughly, and uh, went to the states. Got my doctorate at the University of Arizona in pharmacology. So uh, and when I started as a faculty member in Georgia at UGA, I got into AIDS research, which I was a new area for me because my, my dissertation was on neuropsychopharmacology. So, um, but I, I got into computer-assisted drug design, what we call molecular modeling, you know, building, de- designing molecules with computers, and there was a need for that. So I got into AIDS research, and as time went on, I, I uh, was working with a, a pretty high-powered team. And I made some discoveries that pointed me in the direction of uh, nutritional factors and selenium in particular. Uh, And it was really sort of an accidental discovery, actually, because I was studying the structure of the virus. So when you get into something like AIDS research, it has a tendency to take over your life. Um, And it it did. And I've been studying HIV for 25 plus years, probably 30 years. Um, and, but with this particular focus, I kind of struck out on my own because the more you study drugs as a pharmacy professor, you understand that most of the time drugs don't really, uh, get at the root cause of disease. There are certain ones that can and cure, uh, like perhaps antibiotics, if they help you eliminate the the bacterium that's causing the problem, but most drugs just treat symptoms. And I was kind of more interested in what causes this pathology. What is the mechanism of pathogenesis that's going on. And when you get into that, you, you can't help but get into the whole area of nutritional medicine and the effect of having the right balance of, of biochemicals in your body. And in fact, there was a guy, Canadian guy, who started, you know, contributed to this concept of orthomolecular medicine, having the right molecules in your body and a lot of focus on nutritional factors. So I've been doing selenium and viruses for a long time. Mm-hmm. So when did you uh, first start uh, with selenium? Was that in the, the, the mid-late 80s? Uh, it was mid-90s, actually. So I'd yeah. been doing HIV research for about four or five years, and we were studying the structure of the virus, the RNA structure. And we did a, a, a fairly seminal paper where we were actually looking at drug resistance. Why is it that certain um, drugs d- develop or, or the mutations that the virus uh, accumulates that make it resistant to a drug to make the drug not work. Most people looked at the protein structure and, you know, if you change an amino acid, then the drug won't fit in the protein and you get resistance. But we were interested in at the deeper level of the, the RNA structure that encodes for that protein. And we, and we found that there was a correlation between their second, what we call secondary structure in these uh, RNA molecules. They can fold up in what we call stem loops or hairpin structures. And the hairpin part, the stem part is kind of like a Watson Crick double helix, you know, like where you've got two strands that are forming, uh, they pair up with each other. And we found that there was more mutations in the unpaired loop regions. And that kind of makes sense. But anyway, while I was studying this stuff, I, I stumbled across some, some kind of structure called pseudonauts, which are involved, that are known to trigger a process called frame shifting, where uh, the, the protein is being made at a machine we call the ribosome, and the messenger RNA is kind of like a tape going through the tape recorder being decoded. And uh, it reads the triplet letters of the genetic code. But if it gets off one letter, it ends up getting a totally different message. Uh, so we call these reading frames. 
And usually this is called a frame shift mutation when it happens in your genome, in your DNA, like if a base, if a letter is dropped out of the code, that, that can be a lethal mutation in making this protein. But viruses to figure out how to exploit this mechanism and do it on purpose, slip from one reading frame into another to make a different protein so they can make more stuff. They can get more bang for the buck, basically, uh, by making more proteins with a single piece of RNA. So I uh, found these sites, and they led me to uh, UGA codons, which is a, a stop codon, the genetic code, which just happens to... Uh, also be able to program the amino acid selenocysteine. So that's where the selenium link comes in. And that was only discovered in like about 86 or something. Um, that, and it's a very strange process uh, where a stop codon, UGA, is reprogrammed to become an actual sense codon for an amino acid, selenocysteine. But it requires some very special structures that help make it work. It's a very arcane process. Yeah, but what was interesting to me was that we found a high degree of conservation of certain stop of these UGA codons in HIV. For instance, there's a gene of HIV called the NEF gene, which has been widely implicated as one of the most important ones for the pathogenesis of HIV. Uh, and it ends in a UGA codon. And that UGA codon is very, very highly conserved throughout the main group of HIV uh, subtypes and variants. And uh, it's kind of hard to explain that because if there's two other stop codons that it could mutate into, and since these viruses are notorious for mutating very fast, why is it conserving this one particular stop codon? And uh, so we've been interested in that one for years. So in 1994, I actually predicted, I think the stop codon can be occasionally translated as selenocysteine, which would make an extended form of this protein. It would no longer stop there. It would, it would add on about another 30 plus amino acids. And uh, that could explain a link between that virus and selenium. So that was kind of the start. Uh, and I found you know, similar kind of things going on in different viruses. Uh, the, the problem was where it became controversial and uh, why it was not accepted very much by especially the selenium biology community is that we could, there's some special hardware to make this magic happen, to reprogram the stop codon. You have to have a, a special kind of structure, one of these stem loops, usually down at the far end of the RNA, the messenger RNA, and it helps trigger a process. It binds some proteins, it sticks onto this machine, the ribosome, that translates the RNA into protein, and it prevents the termination from happening and enables the selenocysteine transfer RNA to get in there and be put in that place. And, and the problem was we could never find one of these little RNA hairpins. They're called secus elements. Uh, we could never identify. We found some things that looked like them. We had them tested. We could never find one that worked uh, it, when you put it in, say, a human selenoprotein gene. So that was why people thought, oh, they, they, you know, but at the same time, we could express that protein. We could clone that viral protein, that hypothetical viral selenoprotein, and we could Put, it, put one of the mammalian elements there to help do that magic and express the protein, and we could prove the protein had the function we predicted. Um, mm. And uh, But still, that, that I don't know if people just thought we were just making this up or didn't believe it. So where it all kind of finally came together, it took years for me to like finally realize this, um, was during the Ebola epidemic in 2014, because we'd shown some similar kind of things could happen in Ebola. And we were trying to persuade people that, you know, you should really consider, you know, selenium for, for Ebola infection. And I realized that, you know, viruses, they don't really encode much of their own stuff, right? They're notorious for taking over cells and using the cell's machinery. I mean, they have the minimal stuff. They, they have a few genes that enable them to get in and out of cells and to um, copy their RNA or DNA. Uh, and and the rest of it's just, you know, tr tricking the cell into making stuff for them. So I realized that, you know, the virus doesn't need its own second cell element because it can hijack one from the cell just like it hijacks all this other machinery from the cell. That's the virus <laughs> modus operandi, right? And the way I realized it's doing it, there's something called antisense, where when you have two complementary uh, sequences from a... a you know, in this case, one from the virus and one from a cellular gene. So here you have a cellular uh, mRNA that makes a cellular selenoprotein, something called thyrodoxin reductase, 
uh, that's one of the selenium containing proteins in the body. And it's got this little magical secus element that enables it to reprogram the, the UGA stop codon. And, and guess what happens? Well, we just found complementary sites where the virus comes along and it's got an antisense that is the inverse complement sequence that it can pair up, bind to the cellular one. And now that element can do the same magic on the viral UGA stop codon. So that was the mechanism. And then we started finding this all over and we found, uh, and we showed, so we published a paper in 2016 where we showed HIV could do it in this site in the NEF gene that I predicted in 1994. And there's a gene of Ebola, the nucleoprotein, which is a protein that coats the viral RNA, you know, deep inside the, the snaky virus particle. And there's many, many copies of this gene. And it, it, it also ends in a UGA codon, which is also extremely highly conserved in the very virulent Ebola Zaire strain. Whereas you look at Ebola restin, which is non, non-pathogenic, guess what? There's, it isn't a UGA in that one. It ends in a different codon. And uh, for both of those we've shown, um, there's a technique called reporter genes where um, you can put something like green fluorescent protein, which will, if, if, for, if synthesized in the cell, will fluoresce green when you hit it you know, with the right wavelengths of light. And uh, so you put that gene downstream past that stop codon in a, in a construct that you've cloned. And, and, and it's a way of testing, because if, if it's just stopping at the stop codon, you won't see any green fluorescence. But if it reads through the stop codon, putting an amino acid there or, or somehow bypassing it, that's the only way you're going to get green fluorescence. So um, some of those results are in a poster that I presented at a Ebola meeting in Paris in 2015. That's actually on my ResearchGate site. So if you want to put that up, people can go and actually de- look at that poster and see the green fluorescence, both from the HIV NAF gene and from um, the Ebola nucleoprotein gene. And we're actually just uh, resubmitting a paper today on the NEF story with all of that. So trying to get this stuff out there. And of course, in the meantime, COVID came along and there's a whole similar story of some similar phenomena in COVID. So this is why all of it I've been talking about is basically the backstory or the precedent. Yeah, so um, it, it's, been, it's been kind of shown that um, uh, selenium is an anti-pathogenic factor in emerging zoonotic uh, infections. And so as um, uh, COVID erupts and this uh, research has been done uh, historically, uh, you've also uh, published uh, quite recently at least a preliminary uh, paper with uh, colleagues. And so uh, this relationship between selenium and how it interacts with um, uh, COVID, what are your, some, some of your initial findings uh, at, at this well, stage? Well, yeah, as you say, there is, you know, meanwhile, I was doing all of this sort of theoretical stuff, you know, very arcane molecular virology, uh, you know, theoretical genomic stuff that, that is kind of out of the, the regular sphere of typical virologists and so on who are focused on the experimental side. But meanwhile, there was a, a lot of data accumulating. Uh, well, with HIV, it was became overwhelming. Just dozens of studies published showing a decline of uh, a, a, a progressive decline in selenium status correlating with outcome and mortality. And then they did some clinical trials, at least about three or four of them that have proven that there is a clinical benefit from that. But in China, where they have some really, really low selenium regions and also some really high selenium regions, um, because of the low, the low selenium uh, regions being so large. And back in the mid 20th century, there was a lot of subsistence farming. So people were much more susceptible to the influence of, of how much was in their soil. Because you got to remember, this is an element, a trace element that you know can't be created or destroyed except by a nuclear reaction. So if it's not in your soil, it's not going to be in your diet. And if there's an essential requirement for it in your diet, you're in trouble if you're in a really low selenium region and you you know, grow all your own food or eat animals that are eating the same forage plants off that soil. So they had some problems with uh, heart disease way back in the early and mid 20th century uh, that they, it was kind of a, not what we call a non-obstructive cardiomyopathy uh, the, or dilated cardiomyopathy. The heart would swell up, the muscle would get really weak and swell up and people would die, especially women and, and babies and 
but it would happen in outbreaks. That was where they, they couldn't figure out, it didn't seem to just happen to everybody in that region. It would come in season outbreaks and they suspected there must be, maybe there's a virus or some infectious agent. And they ultimately showed that, yeah, there's an, uh, an enterovirus called Coxsackie virus that they could isolate from hearts. And some people, uh, a scientist, uh, Dr. Melinda Beck at UNC Chapel Hill, used a, made a mouse model of this and showed uh, and it got even more interesting because they showed that if you've got a benign strain of Coxsackie virus and put it in um, uh, mice that were selenium deficient, it would cause this heart pathology. Uh, but then it would mutate into a more virulent form, which would even cause problems in mice that were not selenium deficient. So uh, that has some pretty profound imp implications. But then there's been other, in China, they also have problems with uh, liver disease and liver cancer associated with hepatitis viruses. And then there's something called hantaviruses, which are pretty common in Asia. They, they cause various syndromes called epidemic hemorrhagic fevers, which can have a, um, a respiratory syndrome or a renal syndrome. But uh, just in 2015, a, an international team, kind of like the team that I just worked on doing COVID, they showed a, a kind of a similar thing that, that in the low selenium regions in China, you have a six times higher chance of getting this hantavirus infection. Meanwhile, back about 40 years ago, an old Chinese guy, um, there was an outbreak of epidemic hemorrhagic fever in Mongolia, I believe, and he decided to treat it with sodium selenite, a simple selenium compound, and he got really stunning results. Overall, his overall reduction in mortality was about 80%. Now, if that was a drug, they would be screaming from the rooftops about how great this drug is, right? But everybody just ignored that paper. And it's obviously, it's a hemorrhagic fever. Um, it's not as lethal as Ebola, but that could be a precedent for Ebola. So we've always kept pointing that out. Um, and then there's, of course, there's influenza. Melinda Beck showed similar results for influenza. There's a lot of papers about selenium and influenza. So, and now we have COVID. So you asked about our new paper. Well, basically, we suspected something similar with uh, this coronavirus. And we were able to get, because they've had all these big problems in the past in China and these low selenium regions, the data is very, uh, it's well documented. They, they basically get hair samples from people that live in these regions. And they can say, well, the average hair level of selenium in Beijing is approximately this. And in these other towns is this. And of course, we're collecting COVID uh, case data town by town. And so we just really put that together and we showed uh, what's really striking is there's a town called Enshi City. It's, it's in Hubei province, which is where Wuhan is, which is where the outbreak uh, started. And Enshi is, is famous. It's probably got some of the highest selenium intakes in the entire world. Uh, some people are taking probably 10 times what, what the Americans or, or eight times what they say is the sort of the, the minimum daily requirement here. But it turned out that compared to the rest of the cities in Hubei province, uh, the, the survival rate of COVID in China at the time we took our snapshot of the epidemic uh, was three times higher than the survival rate in all these other cities in, in Hubei province. And similarly, in this uh, low selenium province called Hailangjiang, uh, where Keshan is, where they would had this heart disease I mentioned earlier, uh, there, we compared that to all the other cities outside of Hubei, and there the, uh, the death rate was about five times higher than in these other cities that were, you know, not in this really low selenium province. So that seemed pretty striking. So ultimately, we were able to make a, a correlation. We got a bunch of cities outside of Hubei and uh, showed that uh, there was quite a significant linear correlation that... The, the higher the, the selenium intake as measured in hair levels in these cities, the, the, the higher the cure rate um, for uh, COVID-19. So that was the paper that we just published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition with uh, Dr. Margaret Raymond of the University of Surrey in UK as the team leader. And uh, my, my collaborator, Dr. Jin Sung Zhang and I were the uh, two lead authors on the paper. So. Uh, now, that was, there was no coincidence that we looked at that because Dr. Zhang and I uh, had looked at the SARS virus 17 years ago. When the 2003 SARS epidemic happened, I 
did my genomic analysis when they first sequenced, I think, the proud of Toronto, they got the sequence of the SARS virus. They published that. And sure enough, I found a couple of these frame shift sites, which have very, very specific requirements in this in the sequence to, to function, uh, associated with a UGA codon in the overlapping reading frame, just like what I'd seen in HIV in the past. Um, and uh, furthermore, one of them had significant sequence similarity to a, to a selenoprotein called glutathione peroxidase, which is the, the prototypical selenoprotein that was the first one discovered. Uh, and in fact, that was one of the sites in HIV we showed had uh, the one we cloned and showed it was functional had glutathione peroxidase activity. And other, uh, they found, they actually discovered a couple of other teams have found these this kind of selenoprotein gene in some DNA viruses, much larger uh, viruses. So the idea that a virus can encode this is now longer no longer quite so so crazy. But there's actually a se sequences with glutathione peroxidase homology in an overlapping reading frame of both the original SARS virus and now the SARS cov 2 virus, uh, the cause of COVID-19. So uh, I don't think that this selenium correlation that we've seen just has to do with, oh, it's important for the immune system, and if you don't have enough, your immunity is weaker, and therefore you're more susceptible. Uh, because that's kind of the party line that, oh, you know, and there's no point in, in taking any selenium supplements beyond that. There isn't, whereas, I think if you look at uh, some of the precedents, like Dr. Dr. Ho treating cantivirus in Mongolia, uh, ep epidemic hemorrhagic fever, he used quite a high dose. It was equivalent to about 900 micrograms a day, but he only did it. He only gave it for nine days. So this is what we call a pharmacological use, not a nutritional use mm -hmm. of a selenium compound. And so we're, you know, I'm thinking, I'm hoping that you know somebody will try this. Now there's. There's actually something going on in Liberia. There, there's a guy there who actually was using did, did a trial of selenium versus Ebola back in 2014, uh, and it never really got much publicity outside of Liberia itself. But they, uh, it must have done something because you can find a news item. If you, the guy's name is Dr. Jerry Brown, he was on the cover of Time magazine in 2014 December as you know one of the persons of the year, the Ebola fighters. And they did, of course, didn't mention selenium in the Time magazine article, even though that was part of why he was he'd become famous in Liberia, because you could find news items in Liberian press talking about, you know, people walking out of that Ebola treatment unit um, and having been treated there with, with selenium by Dr. Jerry Brown. Uh, and um, now he's come out, you can find some quotes online where he's saying, oh, well, it wasn't uh, rocket science. We just use multivitamins uh, and, and selenium that you can buy across the counter. But we really, but someone really should investigate and see why this works. But anyway, he's now uh, doing the same thing for COVID. We just found a news report um, how someone had donated a couple few hundred bottles of selenium supplements and he's using them at the 14th military hospital uh, where they're sending their COVID patients in Liberia. So yeah, maybe we'll get some kind of uh, interesting reports. As to now, now uh, selenium can be found in uh, everyday foods. I have uh, you know one Brazil nut here. Depending on where right. it was harvested, would give me you know a daily recommended amount, even more than necessary, perhaps. But uh, what other kinds of foods um, can it be uh, found in uh, if you weren't taking supplements? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it's unlike it's not like vitamin a vitamin like you know vitamin C or whatever that a plant can synthesize. So if you eat your citrus fruits, you'll get it because the plant makes it. Because it's an element, there's absolutely there's no guarantee if the soil that any plant, even your Brazil nuts, you know, there you could possibly grow Brazil nuts in Heilongjiang province in China. It's probably not the right climate, but if you could, um, they might not have this level of selenium. It's because there's high selenium in soils in Brazil. So typically, uh, whole grains, especially ones that are grown in North America, we tend to have pretty good selenium in our soils, whereas there's less in British soils. And, and if you're a carnivore, supposedly organ meats like kidney and liver have you know higher levels. Fish can be somewhat problematic, you probably have it, but 
uh, the problem is there's more mercury pollution and mercury can completely antagonize and neutralize the benefits of selenium and vice they, they and selenium can also have an anti a detoxification effect on mercury and arsenic um so it's a little bit risky if you um are trying to get your and even your brazil nut there's a lot of mercury in brazil from gold mining and also because of deforestation all the mercury that's in the biosphere normally they they, they burn it all up and it comes down as, as ash and increases the mercury content in the soil mm -hmm. so you know there could even be you know some other contaminants that are neutralizing it so the only the only way to really be sure you're getting it, it is it's one of the most things i'm a total whole foods advocate you know eat your eat your fruits and vegetables and and uh, whole grains and and nuts and you should be fine but uh and that's true of almost everything but i but uh, selenium is one thing where it, it it probably doesn't hurt and especially for uh having this potential kind of anti-pathogenic role against viruses um so i'm you know i'm taking a little more if i suspect i have covid or if i think I have a cold because this mechanism applies to, to many RNA viruses. Maybe we can get to that shortly before we run out of time. Um, if I think I'm getting a cold or a flu, first sign of symptoms, I'll take, uh, I'll usually take 200 micrograms of sodium selenite and a few other things. Uh, that's just my personal thing. I'm not prescribing anything for anybody. I'm not a, not a medical doctor. Oh. Uh, and now there, but, there is a, 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 a phenomenon of selenium toxicity if you take way more, of course, as, as well. Yeah, yeah, and it should not be, high doses should not be taken for a long time. Like the dose that Dr. Ho gave uh, versus epidemic hemorrhagic fever uh, was two milligrams of sodium selenite a day for nine days. And if you took that long term, you would definitely start getting, you know, some signs of selenium toxicity. Hey, that's, that, that level would probably it wouldn't really say be lethal, but you might see finding your your weird things happening with your 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 nails and your hair falling out or things. Um, but usually, they, I think the sort of no adverse effects level is about 500 uh, micrograms a day uh, total intake, and so you could be taking a couple hundred micrograms uh, as a supplement and not really having a problem. But you don't need. There's no benefit in taking mega dosing. It's definitely something that uh, people should just run out and you know gobble handfuls of selenium pills. It's not going to help. You know, more, more is not necessarily better. Um, so uh, it has to be done in a, in a context uh, like this, where uh, we do have the novel coronavirus um, out there, and just as uh, from a, a health point of view rather than a medical advice uh, point of view, uh, what. Uh, levels of selenium should people be looking to 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 get in terms of having some positive benefits from from it? Yeah, well, I mean, for long term, if you're taking it as, as you, you can get a multivitamin that might have anywhere from fifty to two hundred micrograms, depending on whether it's touting itself as a you know real antioxidant formulation or something. And you know, and any of those are probably fine. And probably for long-term supplementation, uh, some something with selenium yeast in it uh, is a standard thing is good. Uh, there's a lot of evidence that suggests that the inorganic form, sodium selenite, which has been used um, in certain, you know, short-term treatment things, might have some pharmacological activities that are unique, that are superior. So that's why when I, you know, I might be taking a multivitamin with, with selenium and it might have selenium yeast or selenomethionine, but when I think I have an acute infection, I will switch to sodium selenite because of evidence that I'm aware of, of different mechanisms that it might be more quicker acting uh, and have a few other properties, um, which are too complex biochemically to try to explain. Uh, so that's, the, the story there uh but i think again you've got to realize that nothing works in isolation uh you can't just take that and have a terrible terrible diet and expect to get you know the, the full benefit uh you should really really because you know one nutrient depends on another so for instance for selenium to be incorporated into selenocysteine requires a vitamin b6 uh that's a cofactor in 
that the enzyme that does that synthesis. So you need to have your B vitamins. You need to have, uh, you know, vitamin A. You need to have, uh, you know, complete spectrum of, of nutrition. Uh, and there's some things that have been shown to be possibly, if you're talking about COVID, there's some evidence that vitamin D3 is particularly important. Uh, there's a molecule in your body called glutathione, which is also important. And so uh, there's some people advocating glutathione precursors like N-acetylcysteine or NAC, which was also used by AIDS patients uh, and maybe still is. Uh, so, so what would be the, the, the next piece of research that you would be um, uh, doing uh, in terms of uh, the preliminary work that you've already uh, done related to selenium yeah. and COVID-19 specifically? Okay, well, um, we're, we're working towards trying to validate that some of these uh, sites that, that I'm, I've talked about are functional. When in fact, these frame shift sites in the original SARS virus, we used these in vitro assays and showed they actually were functional. Uh, but it's just very, very first level. But let me, before I you know, get into any of that, let, let me tell you the, the, the simple, kind of the elevator speech of why I think selenium is important for RNA viruses in general. Okay, uh, because this is something that we only really figured out after I figured out this antisense mechanism uh, where these viruses are doing this antisense pairing up with a selenoprotein RNA for something called thyroidoxin reductase. Well, thyroidoxin reductase, it's an important antioxidant in your body and it does a lot of things keeping um, thiols in their reduced state. But one of the things it does, it's also involved in DNA synthesis. Okay, so there's two types of viruses. There's viruses that have RNA genomes and viruses that have DNA genomes. So some DNA viruses are things like uh, smallpox, you know, uh, herpes viruses, uh, uh, papilloma viruses, and number one, no, not typically ones that are involved in pandemic type of stuff or zoonotic transmissions. Almost all of those uh, ones, uh, you make the list, you know, HIV, Ebola, Zika virus, dengue virus, uh, the, the whole list goes on, the coronaviruses, they all have RNA genomes. So the important point is that the way life evolved on Earth, DNA synthesis, DNA chemistry came later. Um, life probably started as RNA. And so DNA chemistry is an add-on to the RNA system. So a cell can only make DNA by using some of the stuff it uses to make RNA. So the, the in other words, deoxyribonucleotides are, are made from ribonucleotides by re reducing this OH group to hydrogen. Bit of chemistry there. But uh, it turns out to sustain that reaction, uh, so, so thyroid oxygen reductase is what keeps the cycle going. And that's where selenium comes in because thyroid oxygen reductase is a selenoprotein in mammals. So one way that a virus could make more RNA is by blocking thyroidoxin reductase. And with this antisense mechanism that I've been talking about in terms of hijacking the secus element, another thing that it would cause is it gums up the work for this RNA to go through the ribosome and make thyroidoxin reductase. So thyroidoxin reductase levels could be decline uh, because of this mechanism. And that would then potentially cause this different problems that could contribute to the pathogenic effects of a virus, such as oxidative stress, more risk of cell death, apoptosis, all of these things. And um, so essentially, the take-home message is any RNA virus is going to be inherently somewhat sensitive to fluctuations in selenium levels uh, in the post because of this important role that selenium is involved in DNA synthesis. And so if you are uh, selenium deficient, you're going to be more susceptible to this because if the virus actually causes a decrease in thyroidoxin reductase RNA translation and there's not much selenium to go around, it's going to aggravate the process or exacerbate the process, then that could lead to enhanced pathogenesis and mortality and so on in low, people with low selenium status, which is what, the, what we reported for COVID in China, that the low selenium people seem to be much more at risk of, of mortality. And the people, but the interesting thing is the people in Enshi City who have unusually high intake of selenium, 
their survival rate was three times higher than the people in other comparable um, cities in Hubei uh, province um, who had lower selenium levels or normal selenium levels. And that to me says that actually having higher than the recommended amount might be helpful in this acute viral infection. It doesn't mean you should take that forever. It doesn't mean that uh, you want to go and take you know, hundreds of micrograms of selenium every day of your life, but maybe for a, a week or two where you're exposed, maybe it might be helpful. Now, I'm saying maybe. I'm not a clinician. I'm not prescribing anything. I'm just saying this is what the data says to me. Uh, anything you'd like to add? Yeah, well, I guess, you know, you asked, you know, before I got into that th thing about the R, the, the, uh, I call this RNA viruses versus DNA synthesis. And it's, it's, a, it's a new explanation of why so many of these RNA viruses, like the list I, I gave you earlier, appear to be sensitive or you know, have increased pathogenic effects in low selenium uh, populations. Uh, and you asked about what research are we doing? And we're essentially trying to prove that these uh, frame shift sites are active. We're going to try to clone a couple of these uh, genes that are frame shift variants of, of known genes and prove that they're functional and hope that that will uh, persuade. I'm also working with my Chinese collaborators, uh, uh, the, the fellow uh, Dr. Jin Sung Zhang, who uh, joined with me on this, this new paper. And he is working with uh, some scientists in China and they're looking at. Um, expression of cellular selenoproteins in infected cells. And I'm saying, based on these antisense interactions, we can see, we predict certain of these human selenoproteins will probably be uh, suppressed in terms of their level. And so we're kind of collaborating with those, those folks. And uh, also trying to write a big review about all the different mechanisms involved, hoping that people in the medical field will uh, pay attention and maybe do something. So I'd encourage people to go to my ResearchGate site. It's kind of like Facebook for scientists. It's just researchgate.net. And if they just, or if they just say ResearchGate and then Ethan Taylor, uh, they will find my, and if they go to the Taylor lab, I've got different projects and a project. And so we're putting updates there. So I'm trying to write some you know, educational materials, and also new, as new research comes out, we will be posting those research articles uh, on that site. So um, Great. hopefully... We'll, we'll link to those uh, in the site. Uh, thank you so much for uh, joining us, uh, Ethan Taylor, on, on Below the Radar. Okay, my pleasure. Uh, let's hope it gets above the radar eventually. <laughs> <laughs>